It is World Immunisation Week and I've been at a vaccination conference in Annecy, France, where I caught up with Heidi Larson, world expert on vaccine confidence, to talk about the past, present and future of vaccine confidence. Heidi, this week it's World Immunisation Week and 50 years since the WHO and others launched the expanded programme on uh, immunisation. So what has changed as we look back over those 50 years in terms of vaccine confidence? Uh, well, 50 years, wow, well, that's right. It's um, We've come a long way in terms of vaccine acceptance. And I think in the beginning, um, in the 80s, we were trying to get what was about 20% of the world uh, having access to these basic six vaccine to pushing towards 80 plus percent of the world successfully. At the time, the diseases we were trying to prevent were very prevalent. And I think there was parents, particularly because they're EPI vaccines for children, expanded program of immunization. Um, um, they, they were more focused on getting the child, keeping the child help, healthy. I mean, it was, it was less of an issue than it is today in terms of prevalence. Some people say the state of, the wobbly state of vaccine confidence we have these days, not everywhere, but is partly because of the success, reducing uh, child mortality, extending um, safe, safe childhood. Uh, a lot of these diseases are not prevalent anymore. So we have different challenges in building confidence, but we also have a lot more vaccines. And that I think we kind of took for granted with that early optimism and enthusiasm around this, you know, how well we did in going from 20 to 80 percent, 80 plus percent. It was somewhere in the world between 75 and 90, I guess. Um, some overreported their successes. But, um, but anyway, it was a tremendous boost to the optimism of the immunization community. Mm -hmm. And I think we took um, public confidence in an acceptance of vaccination, uh, we took it for granted for a bit too long. And we didn't, there was a huge investment in communication and engagement around this global um, expanded program of immunization, WHO and UNICEF together, but with countries. And, and it was a real focus. It was a global focus. And, and one of the central things for a lot of immunization programs, I mean, not immunization health programs, it became the cornerstone of a health system. If you can get your kids vaccinated, that was a test of your system strength. So with all that enthusiasm, we kept adding more and more and more. In the meanwhile, the population's much bigger <laughs> and we have a whole new landscape of technology. So I'm kind of already scooting ahead, but yes. <laughs> so things were already, things were already complex and then COVID happened. Yes. <laughs> so how would you summarize where we are today? Well, unfortunately, I think there was a lot of assumption that because we had this fantastic scientific achievement of actually having vaccines available um, uh, against COVID or, you know, to protect against at least serious illness and death, um, that the world would embrace it. But it, it didn't turn out that way. I mean, well, we did manage to Billions of people have been vaccinated multiple times. So one could say in that sense, it was a success, but it wasn't uh, without stumbling, without resistance, pockets of resistance and, and issues and, and concerns. So uh, unfortunately what we have seen because we've launched our vaccine confidence index in 2015, and we have a lot of background data on confidence before COVID, we have seen, and we reported this in the UNICEF State of the World Children Report last year in 2023, 
that out of 55 countries that we had pre and post data for, 53 had a drop in the perceived importance of childhood vaccines. And that, that was pretty surprising. And when people have asked me what happened there, I think for sure the experience of COVID and the relationship with government and the health system and the pressure people felt about getting vaccinated contributed to this enough already among some. But the other side of the coin is that, um, particularly in poorer countries, they don't typically have adult vaccination programs. I mean, the, the, the basic thing is EPI. So there was a whole other age cohort that started to go online looking for information about vaccines. Uh, we do a lot of social media monitoring in the, in the Vaccine Confidence Project to just hear what the conversations are, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, and typically before COVID, the more contentious conversations were among parents or among, you know, groups that were particularly focused on like the HPV vaccine or a particular vaccine for a particular issue. With COVID, the whole world went online looking for information about vaccines. And a lot of people who before COVID would have answered our nationally representative surveys, do you think vaccines are important? Sure, they're, they're important. Are they safe? Safe enough. Are they effective? Now yeah, they seem to work. Um, and But these same people really had never searched online for information about vaccines or probably hadn't. It wasn't really what they paid attention to. And then with COVID, everybody went online and discovered that it's not all roses. I mean, that there, that there were these debates and these alternative views and these some very negative things, um, not accurate necessarily, but, and I think it put a lot of questions in people's minds that they didn't have before. So I think that's part of what's gone on, um, and we can't turn that tide back. We need to be, you know, more proactive with engaging it and engaging people. Um, I think it was very important for what was already becoming a focus on vaccines for life, because that's another shift in the last fifty years. Is that typically, aside from like the smallpox vaccine. Um, Mo uh, there was a real, I, I don't want to say a bias, but they were very much a pediatric uh, child vaccination was the focus. But over the years, we've seen also they weren't made for people living as long as we do now. So people now need boosters for some things. And then, and then we have, you know, not only flu, but shingles and pneumonia. And then there's HPV. And then we have vaccines for pregnant women. So... Um, there are, uh, it's a whole new landscape of people. The other thing that happened in COVID is that because it was vaccines were getting so much attention, anyone who had their issue to sell jumped on those platforms, especially anyone with some kind of anti-government or alternative. Um, they just saw it as a stage for their grievances. So we saw online an explosion of all different groups jumping onto the vaccine and particularly questioning vaccine platforms. So that's, that's been a challenge. And WHO talks about an infodemic. Now, infodemic, by definition, um, it doesn't mean just negative. It just means too much information. But within that, it was a lot for people to to deal with. But here we are. Here we are. So I asked you, so we taking the opportunity of looking back 50 yeah. years and zooming yeah. out. Yeah. You don't have a crystal ball and you can't see forward 50 years. Yeah. But in general, where do you think the future of this is uh, going? Well, I think vaccines are here to stay. Um, how many of them? people will um, tolerate, especially for, for
for children and infants? I mean, one of the issues that people have is not sometimes a particular vaccine, but, whoa, that's too many vaccines in my, you know, healthy baby. Um, and so I think we are going to have to maybe adjust, especially for the life course, um, and think about can we do two doses instead of three for certain things like with HPV we're trying to we're looking at even single dose how can we um, you know figure out other ways we are trying to there's always the challenge of like they have these what is called the five in one vaccines and the multiple antigen vaccines that the the good news is it's just one injection for a child, but then some parents are concerned there's too many vaccines in there. So you try to fix one problem and the other challenge. I think, um, so I think vaccines are with us. There's a lot of new ways. I think where the innovation will need to and is happening more is in, in alternatives for safe injection. Uh, but also people are like patches and nasal vaccines and that we come up with alternative modes of administration. Um, and we also are moving into injectable therapeutics. So that some people call vaccines, but vaccines by nature are really about prevention. I mean, um, so I think moving forward, um, I see a landscape of um, a multiplicity of types of administration, even microneedle patches. And I think more vaccines for different ages over the life course will be, yeah. Great. Heidi, thank you so much. <laughs> okay.